Do, do you get a sense that the thaw in relations with Beijing is flowing on to international education? I, I never received advice that indicated that some of the chilliness in the relationship over the last few years had led to fewer students coming here. So there's still been a demand? It's still the demand, but I think that if you couldn't get here to study, it's one of the reasons not to study at an Australian university. This decision's going to help us, but it'll help the US and the UK as well. If you can get on a plane and get here, more people, I suspect, from China will want to study here. But I want to make sure that we're diversifying that we're not just encouraging people from China to come back, but we're encouraging more students from all around the world to study here. I'll head off to India in the next few weeks, working with the Education Minister there on a mutual recognition agreement, so we make it easier for students to study here and study and the, the, there. On that graphic there, you can see Vietnam, Indonesia as well. There's, you'd have to think in those two countries there's growth potential. Big time. So you can see on that graph that Chinese students make up around about 38 39% of all international uni students. And then it's daylight to India after that. And then after that, Nepal. And then Vietnam's pretty small. Indonesia's pretty small when you compare it to India and China. I think there's great opportunity for us there to attract more international students from countries like those to come and study here and get one of the best degrees you can get in the world right here in Australia. On to some other matters. The ABC reported claims around Opus Day affiliated schools. Yeah. Uh, are you satisfied with the response to the allegations made? I, I think the New South Wales government's made the right decision. You know, the serious allegations, they've got to be properly investigated, and I think they will be. Uh, it's the right thing to do to refer it to the New South Wales Education Standards Authority. They're the body that have got the right powers there to seek documents, seek answers, and find out whether there has been a breach of state or even the Commonwealth Education Act. My department, Kieran, wrote to the New South Wales Education Standards Authority this morning um, and asked them to keep us informed of their investigation as well as what the outcomes of it might be or, or, or are when it concludes. When a similar situation happened a couple of years ago with Malik Fahd Islamic School in Western Sydney, um, an allegation was made, the New South Wales Education Standards Authority conducted an investigation and then the Commonwealth Department uh, appointed an independent person to conduct their own audit. Uh, and my department's advised Nessa today that depending on the outcome of their investigation, they might do the same thing. OK. And now on to the broader uh, school system. Uh, New South Wales Labor and the campaign yesterday committed $400 million to the, that state's school system. Still going to be a 5% uh, gap in the school resource standard. Will the federal government... That's basically the level that was set by the Gonski mm. approach. Will the federal government step in and fill that gap of 5% funding? Yeah, we made the commitment in the campaign to work with states and territories to get all schools to 100% of funding. You know, I want to see 100% of schools 100% funded. Uh, I welcome that announcement by Chris Minns yesterday because it gets us closer to that. Um, the report that came out from the Productivity Commission a couple of weeks ago was blistering in its criticism of the current education agreement that the former government struck, basically said there's no targets and there's no reforms to get us to where we need to get to. So when will you get them? Well, we've, we've, we've got that report now. Um, we are going to set up an expert panel to give us the advice we need on what are the reforms that we need to fund to fix the problems that report identified. If you're a kid from a poor family or from the bush or an Indigenous young person, that report tells us that you're three times more likely to fall behind at school. So we need to make sure that we're funding schools properly. Funding's important, but what we spend it on is even more important. We've got to fund it on the things that will work. And I was heartened to see... Are the schools, you know, in simple terms, are those schools not equipped for those additional funds to be spent? Well, in some The cases, ones that aren't at that 100% well, really mark. So I was at a school yesterday, met a teacher who told me about her boy who, by the time he was eight, couldn't read. She was a teacher. She broke down telling me this story. Um, went through reading recovery, still couldn't read. She used $20,000 of her own money that she got from a will from a, from a relative who passed away to get him out of school and to fix his reading skills. Between third grade and fifth grade, in the NAPLAN testing, he went from flunking to succeeding. Not every parent can afford $20,000 for that small intervention, small intervention in terms of one teacher and a couple of students to help them to fix their reading. Now, what was spoken about yesterday 
by Chris Minns, by the Premier, by Grattan, was whether we should be funding at a greater level these reading and writing tutoring programs to help kids who are falling behind to catch up. Strikes me pretty sensible. It's the sort of thing I'm talking about when I'm talking about making sure that we invest the money on reforms that are going to make a difference to the kids who need it. The South Australian Premier committing to, or well, he's implementing a ban on mobile phones across schools in that state. Chris Minns committing to do the same in New South yeah, Wales. WA, wins. I think, as well. Do you welcome that? Yeah, you know, the decisions for the, the state governments, but strikes me as pretty sensible. If you're looking at your phone, you're not focused on the teacher, you're not focused on learning. So you support yeah, those moves? Yeah, seems like a pretty sensible thing to me. What about the, uh, on another matter, Jim Chalmers, his essay, the values-based capitalism that he's, uh, he's argued for, it's caused a bit of a flurry, some suggesting in it's, some quarters, at, in some quarters. it's at odds uh, <laughs> with the Hawke-Keating legacy. What do you think? I think PJK sort of put a nail in that today, didn't he? Um, you know, what Paul was about, what Bob was about, is about good governments working with business and with unions and the broader community to get the right outcomes. That's what Jim's about. That's what he said today in that op-ed in the Fin Review. Now, uh, we've seen today a bit of a... We've been talking about New South Wales a bit. It is an election campaign. Josh Landis, uh, CEO of Clubs New South Wales, said the Premier um, had acted from his conservative Catholic gut rather than based on evidence when it comes to pokies. Mm. He's issued an unreserved apology, which is, I think, appropriate. Yeah. What do you make of those I comments? I think everyone would agree. Uh, I saw your interview with Michelle Rowland. It was the wrong thing to say. It's a good thing that he apologised. It's a good thing that he picked up the phone and apologised in person or... On the phone. Jason Clare, Education Minister, I appreciate your time. See you soon. Good on you. Thanks, mate.